I hope you guys enjoyed Steve Daneman's uh, lecture yesterday. Uh, I felt like he gave new meaning to the words hard act to follow and doing like 25 minutes of math calculations after he's running around and up the aisles, etc. Giving his talk was hard, but I thank you guys for uh, sticking with me. Um, and let me, uh, we, have, we have done the flop and we still have the turn in the river and we have a few other concepts to cover. So I'm going to try to get through everything. First I'm going to talk though about the tournament last night that we had. Uh, we had 178 players in the satellite and it lasted less time than the previous one, three and a half hours. Uh, I hope that you guys enjoy this next bullet. I know I don't, but um, I didn't win a single hand. And I had a chop, but I didn't win a single hand. And that happens in tournaments. Uh, I arguably have more knowledge and skill than many people who were in the tournament yesterday, and yet I went out very, very quickly. Uh, I tried to do a few things, mostly just waited for good hands, didn't get them, and was out. And so if it could happen to me, it could happen to you, you don't feel bad about it, you just play another tournament. Um, so I want to ask everybody who made the final table, that's one through nine on here, to stand up and be recognized. Getting through a field of uh, 178 players and being one of the final nine, it takes a lot of talent, skill, patience, and luck. Um, there's no way around it because the delta in skill in a large group like that can't be that significant. And so there's some skill differential, but it also, you know, when you win a tournament, you're going to have to get lucky at some point. Um, I want to ask Sheria, if I'm saying that right, to stand up, the winner last night. There he is. Nice job. Um, and I want to get special recognition. I want three people to stand up. They qualified for both satellites, so they were in the top uh, group for, all, for both of them. And uh, Claudia also does research in my lab, so she's got skills besides poker. So, um, so let me jump before we go into the turn play and talk about the metagame. A lot of people have asked me various questions throughout this course, and uh, I even mentioned yesterday when Steve was here about should you ever show your hand. And this is a slide that I had in the deck unchanged since yesterday. And Steve said in the main event when he came in second, he showed every hand and that he thinks that there are reasons to do that. Um, I totally disagree with him. I think that you should never show your hand. There's actually a book titled Never Show Your Hand. Um, and th there are several reasons for this. Um, if you show your hand because, so, so Daneman's argument for why you should show your hand was, I wanted those guys to know that when I bet I have it, right? He's trying to create a table image, I don't bluff, and that way later on he can make bets and people will think that he has it and they'll fold. The problem is that you give off a lot of information when you show your hand. If you don't show your hand, and this of course has nothing to do with online play, uh, where you can't show your hand, and some online sites have a way that you can show your hand. But let's say that you have a particular physical tell. Um, you do something when you're really strong, you don't do it, and really good players are trying to pick up on tells all the time. And you do your tell, and then you show your hand that you were strong, and they're gonna, now they'll, have, they'll be able to match up how you played with what you did. The other thing is your betting patterns. They're going to pick up on that. And there's really, it's better to have a mystery about you so that, um, in fact, Sometimes when you bet, you want them to be afraid that you might be weak. And why is that? Well, let's say that they bet, and you three bet them, and then they fold. And now you've got a reputation that you're a bluffer. Um, and so having a reputation that you're a bluffer makes them less likely to bet into you because they're afraid that you'll bluff them off a decent hand. And so in order to have people not know how to play against you, I wouldn't show my hand. Um, so this is kind of what I just said. You want people to wonder every time you make an action whether your range is tight or wide, they just have no idea. There is an advanced move called the accidental show your cards on purpose. Um, how many of you uh, watched Larry David's show, uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm? He had the accidental text on purpose where you uh, text somebody something but you pretend that you did it by accident and you meant to text it to someone else but you actually meant to text it to that person. So if you're trying to establish a particular table image and you uh, 
don't want to show your hands because you don't want to look like a player who shows his hands, you could like accidentally show your hands. I don't recommend that you do this, but I have actually seen people accidentally show their hand where I felt that they were doing it on purpose. And some of the pros make a living with table talk. Um, they know how to say things to you that will give them information about your hand. Um, and so I think you need to, if you're not one of those pros, you need to limit your talk. Uh, I'll tell you that one particular tell that's very common is if you're strong, you talk a lot. And I think that's pretty reliable. And so you don't want to talk when you're weak or when you're strong. You want to kind of be the same. So in doing this research for this course, I found that there are two rules for success in poker. Never reveal everything you know. OK. So I'm going to talk about physical tells now. Thank you. A couple of laughs. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right. So personally, I'm not a huge fan of using tells. Uh, some people swear by them. Uh, Mike Caro is a very famous uh, poker pro who has a book on tells. And I think that there are just too many books and too many players who have read the books and they're faking the tells as much as people are doing the tells. And tells are specific to individuals, even though the books will say if somebody does this, then they're strong, and if they do that, then they're weak. Different people have different tells. Um, I think a really good tell to use is a bet sizing tell. Uh, there are some people that they always bet opposite. So if they have a really good hand, they check, and if they have nothing, they bet. And it's like the absolute backwards play, and I don't recommend that. So let me tell you some of the common tells. Um, that are in these books, which you can do what you want with this information. But uh, one of the tells is that you stare hard at someone when you're weak. And I was reading these poker tell books, and I had read everybody says if somebody's like staring at you and staring really hard and they won't take their eyes off you, they're weak. And the reason is they're trying to intimidate you and make you think that they're really strong. Um, and I have to say, I was at the Borgata in Atlantic City playing in a big game and I had a big decision to make. And a guy was like staring at me and staring at me and staring at me. And I'm like, well, he must be weak. So I call and it was wrong. He, he was either faking it or that he just was a guy that stares at you. <laughs> so there's a common uh, tell that somebody's hand shakes when they're strong. Um, you just have to make sure that their hand doesn't always shake because it may be the case that they just shake. Um, another tell is to sit back in your chair and cross your arms when you're strong. I think that's a pretty reliable one. I don't remember ever seeing somebody doing that when they were bluffing, so that's one that you can keep in mind. And they chit chat a lot, and they seem comfortable when they're strong because they're not bluffing and they're not really worried. Um, and another one is that they take a sip of water. They go like, you know, you're playing and you're waiting for that decision. People usually do that when they're bluffing. Now, I don't actually believe in most of this stuff, but there are people that do, and, and there's a whole, you know, bunch of books about this topic. So I think uh, what I thought I would do is go from the best and hear what he has to say about tells. OK, so let me talk for a minute about tilt. Tilt is a real thing, and we've all been there. Even good players go on tilt. Tilt is when you lose half your stack on a bad beat or something like that, and then you, you just feel so horrible, so you want to win it all back right away. And then somebody three bets, and then you go all in, right? So an ideal situation, you can actually exploit tilt a little bit, is that you lose a hand that should put you on tilt. And everyone at the table is talking about how you got two outed. And the next hand, you pick up a monster hand, OK? So you get pocket aces. And you act like you're making an overly large bet, right? So somebody raises three big blinds, and you re-raise you know, 15 big blinds. Obviously, you're on tilt. Maybe you try to act. Don't overdo it, but try to act a little miffed and just do that. And then everyone's going to think you're on tilt, and someone might play back at you. But if you feel that you're getting in tilt in a cash game, I recommend getting up and walking away. Don't try to win it all back. It really happens. It's a real part of poker. I get tilted, too. And um, in a cash game, it's OK, because you can always just come and go. In a tournament, it's a little harder to just walk away. Um, what I like to do if I feel tilted is to play a little tighter for a while, kind of force myself under control, and just try to recognize if I'm about to make a bad decision. All right, I'm going to switch gears now. Um, we haven't talked much about live play, playing at a table with people, and all the play we've done in the class so far has been online. So let me talk a little bit about 
do's and don'ts, uh, and these are important so that you don't look like a complete amateur who doesn't know what they're doing if you sit down in a casino for the first time and you want to play. And most of these things are true both in cash games and in tournaments. So if you move chips forward, that's a bet. And you may not think you're betting. You may think that you want to arrange your chips so you know how many you have, and you accidentally take some chips and put them forward. The dealer is going to then say, you just bet that. So be careful how you move chips. If you want to count out a bet, so oftentimes you want to take one of the 500s, one of the 1000s, and two of the 25s, and that's going to be your bet. And you can count them out to your side. And when you have it all counted out, you push it forward. But if you start counting and you take three chips and you put them here, thinking that you're going to add to them, that's it. That's your bet. So keep that in mind. Also, you have to act when it's your turn. We go around the table, going to the left. And there are rules in the casinos for what happens if you act out of turn. So in most casinos, in a cash game, they won't do anything about it. But in a tournament, if you act out of turn, you're going to have to sit out a hand. And if you do it again, even if you're the big blind, and if you do it again, you're going to have to sit out an entire round. Acting out of turn means that it's the under the gun's time to act, and you're a couple seats later, and you make a bet, or you check, or you do something. The other thing about acting out of turn is that it's binding. So whatever it is that you do, let's say you bet 300 because you think that it's your turn and that a bunch of people folded. If you bet 300 and the dealer says you just acted out of turn, you take it back and if everybody folds and it gets to you, you have to bet 300. You're committed to the out of turn bet. But if somebody else bets, that's called changing the action and you can take back your 300 and then you can fold or you can raise or you can do whatever you want. Your, your commitment is undone if somebody else puts money into the pot. Um, pace of play is very important. If you play in a live game, you're allowed to think about big decisions. So you can calculate pot odds and you can do what you want. But you're going to be treated differently by the tournament director and by your dealer if you're making a, a play for a few big blinds or for your entire tournament life or for like a lot of cash. So the dealer's discretion is going to be how important is your decision, how long are they going to let you think about it. It can be really disruptive in a tournament. It's called tanking. If someone goes into their tank and they're thinking and thinking and thinking, one of the other players is allowed to call the clock. And it's, it's called calling the clock. And you say, dealer, I want to call the clock. The dealer will call the tournament supervisor over. And they'll give you one minute. And if you don't make a decision within a minute, you fold. You, they'll fold your hand. Uh, they won't call the clock on you if the dealer doesn't think you've had enough time to make the decision. So again, if it's a really big decision, you have more time. But you will really, really annoy experienced players if you're the person that has to think through everything. So do all the pot odd calculations in advance. Know some rules of thumb, the rule of two, the rule of four. But don't sit there trying to figure out every possible hand in the other person's range and probabilities and adding it all up, because you won't have time to do that. Um, in a tournament, you, when the action is complete, you have to turn over your hand. Or if somebody is all in, you have to turn over your hand and then uh, you deal out the rest of the cards. In a casino, different from online, they do that in online cash games too, but in a casino, in a cash game, if you're all in, you don't have to show. You only have to show if you want to claim the pot. And so if you call someone, they're going to be the ones that have to show first, and if they know that they're beat because you called them, they may just muck their cards, and then you can turn over your cards and claim the pot. In fact, if the other guy mucks, and you're the only one left, you don't even have to show your hand. So one reason not to muck is if you want to see what the person had, show your hand and then they have to show in order to claim the pot. Slow rolling. How many of you know what slow rolling is? Just a few people in the back. Slow, and one in the front. Slow rolling is a really, really big deal. And slow rolling uh, probably accounts for more beaten up people in garages outside casinos than anything else. It is a nasty, nasty thing to do to somebody. And a lot of beginner players do it because they think it's funny. But it's really, really viewed as being the lowest of the low. And what slow rolling is, is let's say that I flop the nuts. And we're in a tournament. And you are my opponent, and you go all in. And I sit there, and I act like I have a decision to make. right? I just sit there. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I, the only reason you could possibly be doing that is to, is to kind of be mean, right? Because that person just put their tournament life at stake. You know you're about to knock them out, and you're not turning over your cards. So it's a slow rollover of your cards. There are a lot of situations where you crush somebody, and you know it, and you don't let them know it right away, 
and that's called a slow roll. So I, I found a lot of really entertaining video clips to show you of slow rolls, and I wanted to pick one. There's a super famous one that I encourage you to look for that I didn't choose with Mike Matisau, the mouth. The reason that I didn't choose it is it's 15 minutes long, and I have a lot to talk about today. But he gets, Sean Deeb, who's a famous player, flops quads, and he has it in for, for Mike Matisau. They have kind of a rivalry going. And so he slow rolls them in an epic, epic slow roll. And it's actually quite famous. And a lot of famous players are at the table. And Matisau loses it over the course of 15 minutes to the point where he has to be restrained. And so it's kind of fun to watch. But I'm going to show you one. Um, what I'll tell you about this slow roll is a couple things to watch for. The number one thing is the reaction of the announcers. In this table, the other players are not mic'd, so you can't see what they're saying. But every single player at the table is berating the slow roller and giving him a hard time. And he clearly knows what he's doing, and he's doing it to one of the real uh, kind of gentlemen of the game. The other thing I really like about this is that I taught you guys what a donk bet is. How many of you remember a donk bet? You lead out into the preflop razor when you actually should be checking to the razor. Um, the announcers, there's a donk bet in this hand, and the announcers call it out, and it's kind of, kind of interesting. So, um, also this clip about the first 44 seconds have nothing to do with the, what I want to show you, so I'm going to skip it. Okay, you get the idea the announcers did not like it. <laughs> okay, let me tell you the one chip rule. Uh, the one chip rule is the most misplayed uh, thing that new players do. And it really will always get you in trouble if you don't know about it. So even my brother, who's been playing poker for many, many years, he played online, uh, played in a home game, and my house wasn't familiar with the one chip rule and got in trouble for it. Does anybody know what the one chip rule is? OK. Um, one person who I told this morning. <laughs> OK, so here's the one chip rule. If you put in one chip, one chip, whether it's $1,000, $500, $10,000, if it's one chip, it's a call, no matter what. It's not a raise. So let's say that you're playing in a home game or in a casino, and somebody bets $200. And you have queens, and you want to make it $1,000. If you take a $1,000 chip and you put it in the pot, the dealer will say, call. It's a call. Every poker player knows that. Okay, So you have to do one of several things. If you say raise before you put the chip in, then it's a raise. Verbalizing is important. If you say, I bet 1,000, and then you put the chip in, you bet 1,000. Or you could take two $500 chips and put them in. Anything that you bet that's more than one chip is what it is. So if it's more, then it's a raise. And you have to always raise at least the previous raise. We talked about that on day one. So if somebody makes it 200 and the blinds are 50, 100, you can't make it 250. You have to make it at least 300 because you've got to raise the previous raise. Don't, everybody will mess up. If they do this, you know, the first time, it's you're going to forget and you're going to want to put a thousand in. Don't do it. Say raise. In fact, you're best off if you just always verbalize. The second, these are the two biggest mistakes people make who aren't familiar with the etiquette in poker. The second is a string bet. A string bet is not allowed, and what that is is let's say that you want to bet three thousand. So you take out two thousand and you put it in the pot, and then you reach back into your uh, stack. You take another thousand and you put it in the pot. That's 3,000, but that's a string bet. Only your first one counts. You're only allowed one forward motion. And part of the reason for that is, let's say that I, I put in 2,000, and as I'm doing it, I get a reaction from you where you seem happy, but I've got the nuts. So then I'm going to be like, well, I wasn't done betting. You know, you use that reaction to bet a little bit more. So that's not allowed. You, if you move your hand forward, you're betting. And if you put in one chip, it's a call. And if you want to put more chips in, too bad. You get one shot at it. Um, the best thing is to just announce your bet, because oral statements are bi binding. So let's say that I push 3,000 into the middle, and at the same time I say 5,000. That's a $5,000 bet. It's not a 3,000. Whatever you say takes precedence over what you do. There are a lot of disputes in tournaments where somebody will throw a big chip in, and as it's landing, they'll say, raise. And then the other guy will be like, that's a call. Be like, no, no, I said it before it hit the felt. And then you get into the whole argument. So best to avoid that. Another thing is table talk. Um, so in a tournament, in a casino, a serious tournament, you are not allowed to say anything about your hand. You're allowed to talk about the weather. You're allowed to ask somebody if they're happy that you bet that. But you can't say anything about your hand. 
Um, the most common thing that you will hear is, will you show me if I fold? So that's kind of cliche. Another thing to point out is called angling. And it's considered bad form. And it's kind of a gray area whether it's against the rules or not. Um, so let's say that you're in, a, you're in a hand and the guy makes a big bet and you call and then you say, yup, I had the boat. Boat is a full house. You say, yup, I had the boat. I've seen this happen. And the other guy's like, oh man, you got me. And he mucks his hand and then you muck your hand. And you never had the boat. You just got the guy to muck his hand and so you win the pot. That's called angling. It's, it's I think, unethical, amoral. Um, whether it's illegal is actually questionable. I mean, you just said something and then the guy mucked, but don't ever do that. And you can get kicked out of a home game for doing that. Um, another thing that I've seen is, um, is sort of can be funny, but also can give you, it can be angling and it can be a move. And what that is, is let's say that you're in a tournament and the biggest chip in denomination is 5,000. And I've seen casinos where the 5,000 chip is for some reason a similar color to the 500 chip. And so what you do is you take a 5,000 chip and a 100 chip and you throw it in. And after it lands and it's clear that it's in the pot, you say 600. And then the dealer's like, oh, look, you threw in a 5,000 chip. And you say, no, 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 I meant to put it in a 500. And everyone's like, too bad, too bad. And it is too bad. You have to, you're committed. That 5,000 is there. It hit the, the pot before you said anything. There are people that do that on purpose with a really strong hand. Because now, say you're another player and you're like, you have a decent hand and you think the guy was just raising 600, there's 5,100 in there, you just go all in. And all kinds of crazy stuff happens when that happens. If that happens by accident, so be it. Most of the time, everyone will just fold. But there are people that will do that on purpose and that's angling. It'll get you kicked out of a home game. Uh, you'll have to watch out in the parking lot. Question. Yeah, the reason that that doesn't work is that the one chip rule is so ingrained in poker that no one will think that you did that. Um, in fact, a lot of players that want to preserve their smaller chips, like in a cash game for tips and stuff, they'll throw in a $25 chip to call a $2 bet just to get some change. So it, everybody knows it's a call. And so I don't think that angling would be believed. Yes? Yeah. You would either get it from the pot or he would give it to another player. If you actually had two dollars, he might say, can you just give me two dollars? But sometimes you, you've bet all your ones and you don't have them and then you just, you'll get changed from the dealer. Yes? Very often there's a line drawn in the felt, but most casinos don't consider the line to play or to be a thing. It's just how they make poker tables. There are casinos where the line is the betting line. And in the old days, it was called the betting line. And it was literally, if you crossed the line, it was in otherwise. But nowadays, um, it's a dealer discretion. I mean, if it's pretty clear that you were counting chips out two inches, and then you push it all forward, they're going to let that slide. But if you go five inches, it's going to be, you might have a dispute. Anytime there's a dispute in the casino, the dealer will yell, floor or supervisor, and there are supervisors roaming around and they're gonna come over, the dealer will describe the dispute. Let me, let me jump ahead, because I have this on a later slide, but it's relevant now. If, um, if the floor gets called over and the dealer starts describing to the floor what happened, and you're at the table and you disagree, don't say anything. Don't say, um, no, 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 the guy did this, unless you're, you're particularly involved in that decision. So if it involves you, you can argue with it. But so many times I see there are two guys in a dispute, the dealer and the floor are trying to work it out, and the guy sitting over there starts to offer his opinions. You shouldn't do that. It's considered bad form. Any other questions? This is great. I have a bunch more of these type of rules. Um, Oh, so let's say that somebody makes a huge bet and there's a guy with a really tough decision and he's sitting there and you know, it's a cash game, it's a $3,000 decision. And two guys on either side of him are talking about their kid's baseball game and they're just having an animated conversation. The polite thing to do is to stop talking and let that person make their decision. 
So many times you see people talking over others. Poker is very social, it's fun. One of the things I like about it is you go, you meet people. But you should pay attention to what's going on at the table and not be kind of talking when someone's making a tough decision. Another thing I already mentioned to you guys, um, really, there are a lot of people that sit there and tell their bad beat stories all day at the poker table and everyone else is rolling their eyes. Like I said, it's really fun to tell bad beat stories, but it's not fun to hear them. I see it all the time where people say what they folded. Oh, I folded five, six, I would have made a straight. Oh my God, this, that. And, th and that's also fun to do. But hey, you folded and you didn't make it and nobody cares. So that's, that's just um, a little bit of etiquette because you'll find that if you don't, if I didn't teach you these things and you start doing them in a casino, you'd be really unpopular. Okay, even more. It's very good idea to protect your cards. By that I mean take a, have a, like a card protector. I play with a, with a coin. It's an extra large coin that I put on my cards. Some people have a silver dollar. Uh, some people will just take a chip off their stack, like the lowest denomination chip, and every time they're in a hand, they put the chip on their, on their cards. One of the reasons to do that is sometimes the muck gets spread out or somebody's card gets dealt and it flies across the table. If it gets mixed in with your cards, your hand is dead. So even if you have a really good hand that you care about, if, if it becomes mixed with other cards, your hand is dead. And anytime your cards hit the muck, your hand is dead. So if you put something on your cards, it's a good way to protect them. It's also nice etiquette because it shows the other players that you're in the hand. Exposed cards is an interesting phenomenon. So there are different ways a card can get exposed. The dealer throwing the cards across the table may hit somebody's hand and the card will pop up. And so now that card's exposed. So what the dealer will do is take that card back and continue dealing, not dealing to the person who didn't get the card, but just continuing after them. When they're done dealing, they'll take the very last card and give it to that person. And the reason is there are superstitious people, we met one yesterday, who think that they care about which card they would have gotten, right? And so if you started dealing the next card to the person whose card got exposed, everybody would get a different card than they would have gotten had the card not gotten exposed. And so those cards continue to get dealt around and the exposed card becomes the burn card. Um, you guys have, I think we talked about burn cards, but when the dealer deals, after they deal out the cards, they burn a card, meaning they just put a card in the muck, face down, and then deal three up, the flop. They burn another card, then they deal one up, they burn another card. And the reason for the burn is so that the top card on the deck isn't the one that goes in as the turn, and it prevents certain kinds of cheating. Um, so don't splash the pot. Splashing the pot is very, very common for beginners. And what that means is, Let's say there's already a pot in the middle, you know, $20 from the pre-flop action, and then the flop comes, and you want to bet six. You put six in front of you, it needs to sit like right in front of you. But a lot of people will just throw it in, and it mixes in with the pot, and now it's not clear how much they bet. And if no one counted the pot, then there could be a dispute. So each person should keep it in front of them. Another thing not to do, and I didn't put this in the slide because I just thought of it, is don't start making change. And the reason is, let's say that one person bets 30, and the next guy, he only has $25 chips. So he puts in 50. If you put in a little over, that's a call. Um, and so as long as it's not more than half the difference between double the bet. So what do I mean by that? If you bet 100 and you bet more than 150, that's actually 200. So, and then they'll make you put in 200 because the 50 is the halfway point in between them. But let's say that somebody bets 30 and you only have $25 chips, so you put two of them in the middle. And what you'll often find in home games is some guy, somebody will reach in, and they even try to do it in casinos, and see a bunch of $5 chips in the middle, and they'll break the 25 and start making change for people. That's not a good idea, because let the dealer handle it. What'll happen is, let's say then somebody makes it 150, and now uh, somebody else re-raises, and you forget how much you actually had in front of you, because somebody was messing with it. Um, the easiest thing is just let the dealer be the only one that ever touches the chips except your chips when you're betting. Um, now here's one that I find people don't realize they're doing something really bad is to say what you had in a way that people can hear it. Because you can affect the action. Let's say the board comes king, king, eight, and you turn to your neighbor, you're like, man, I folded a king. Well, the other guy still got a decision to make and now he knows that the guy that bet into him is less likely to have a king because you had one of the kings. So don't talk about your hand while the hand is still alive. Once the hand is over, there's a r another reason not to talk about it, but it's much less important, which is just, it's annoying. But in this, you could actually change the action. Keep the cards on the table at all times. So hold them, you only have two cards, right? 
You look at your cards, make sure they're still touching the table. In some casinos, if you pick them up and look at them and go like this, your hand's going to be dead. You cannot take the cards off the table. Um, here's another one that is very important in tournaments, and this is a requirement, and if you don't do it, you'll probably get scolded in a casino, which is if you have um, $25 chips, $500 chips, $1,000 chips, $5,000s, you have to keep the big chips where they're visible to all the players at all times. So you keep them in the front of your stack with maybe the thousands, with the five thousands on top. Always arrange it so that your little chips are in back. So this is a handy thing to know, right? Because if you're watching a tournament on TV now and you're trying to figure out what chips are what colors, the chips that are closer into the person are the low chips. The chips that are in front and on top are the big chips. And let me talk a little bit about a hit and run. I have a disagreement with a lot of my friends about this one. A hit and run is where, let's say I'm sitting down in a cash game, I just arrived and uh, I win a huge pot. I get aces versus kings, we get it all in, I win a few hundred dollars. Next hand, I do the same thing to the same person and I'm like, wow, I just made like $5,000 an hour in 20 seconds. I think I've had a good day, I'm going to leave now. And different people have different opinions about that. My personal belief is poker is poker, and if you want to leave, you're perfectly within your rights to get up and leave. That said, if you're in a home game, somebody, you take a big pop from them on a bad beat, they're going to want a chance to win it back. What you can do is play a few hands, just fold them, don't even look, go to the bathroom, come back, chit chat, say, oh, I've got to make a call, make a call, let 15 minutes go by and then leave. Do I think you need to do that? No. Do I think you're going to be more popular if you do that? Yes. So if you just get up and leave, some people are very sensitive to the hit and run. Okay, there's even more etiquette. Uh, this one is kind of obvious. You maintain good hygiene because you're going to be sitting next to people. In a cash game, you can always get up and move, but you might get stuck in a tournament next to someone where you can't even breathe. Um, now, in live cash games, I think I already told you guys this, after you win every hand, you should throw a dollar to the dealer. Just throw a dollar back in the pot and the dealer will say thank you. They'll tap the table twice with it, probably for the cameras, and they'll stick it in their tip jar. And that's what everyone does. It's interesting that I've been at a table where there's a new guy who clearly is out of his element, has no idea what he's doing. He's there with a friend. Um, you, you're usually not too sad to see that. And there's guys sitting there and he's trying to play and he just doesn't even know how to play. And he, he wins some pot, he doesn't tip the dealer. What I do is I say, um, to me it seems like maybe uh, you haven't played a lot and it's customary if you win a pot to give a dollar to the dealer and then they'll usually be very thankful that you've taught them a little bit of etiquette. Um, in a tournament, you tip at the end of the tournament if you're one of the winners. I talked about checking it down. Um, make sure if you do this in a casino, everyone will expect you to do it, that you don't verbalize at all what you're doing. You don't say, let's check it down. That's against the rules. Just check it down. Here's a confusing thing that I see a lot. Someone will say, I raise 50. What do they mean by that? Do they mean they're raising 250? Or do they mean 50 more? Then let's say you bet 25 and they say, I raise 50. Is that 75 or 50? And it's ambiguous. So you should always say, make it 75, or I raise to 75. Or you could say, 50 on top. But don't just say, I raise 50. Um, another thing that you see a lot in home games and casinos is somebody will be playing and they're going to fold. But right before they fold, they have like the neighbor they become friendly with and they kind of show them what they're folding and then they fold it. You see that all the time. That's what people do. Um, it's, I wouldn't do that. If they're not in the hand, there's technically nothing wrong with that, but it's just not really nice. There's a show one, show all rule, which is if you show your hand to one person, you have to show it to everyone at the table. And that is when a hand is over. So like during a hand, you obviously can't show it. But let's say that you're there with your friend, and you put in a big raise and everybody folds, and then you turn to your friend, you show them your cards, and then you muck them. The dealer will pick them up and show everyone. And somebody can ask to see them, but most dealers will just turn it over because of the show one, show all rule. And finally, there's rabbit chasing. Rabbit chasing is where you, um, you want to know what the turn in the river would have been. So the hand ends on the flop, and you were on a draw, and you like ask the dealer, could you please show me the turn or show me the river, and they'll just kind of show it. Um, that's 
mixed bag. Like in a lot of home games, people just do it all the time. In a casino, the dealer could get fired for doing it, so don't uh, do it. What I have seen dealers do, if they know the players at the table and they're trying to be friendly, is they'll say, I'm not going to do it for you, but I haven't picked up the cards yet, and then you can kind of reach in and do it. But in general, I don't recommend doing that. OK. Um, oh, if the pot is chopped, so let's say that we have a hand where the two people tie, and the pot is broken into two even amounts, but there's an extra chip, right? Because let's say there's 101 in the pot, so it'd be 50-50, and who gets the one? The player who was out of position gets the extra chip. There's more etiquette, but we're almost done. Um, this is the one that I mentioned earlier. Don't help the dealer. Let them figure out the side pots. Let them figure out the disputes. They've got a job for a reason. They're really, really well trained. The exception to that is I played in some charity tournaments, not the one that you know about, but other, other charity tournaments where the dealers really aren't well trained. They, they're volunteers. They don't know what they're doing. And you guys now know more than they do. So if you see them struggling, you can help them out. If there's a dispute, just don't get involved. Third man walking is if you're in a cash game in a casino and there's a long wait list of people who want to play, which happens very often. Like at the MGM, I was there once and the 1 3 and the 2 5 games had like 150 people on the wait list with like 10 tables going. So um, there's a lot of people that want to get in there. If two people are away from the table because they took a break or went out to get some food, that's fine. But if the third person leaves the table, that's called the third man walking. They're going to give that seat away. So if you're at a table and you're playing cash in a busy casino and two people are off, you should ask the dealer if they're enforcing the third man walking rule because you don't want to lose your seat and then go back to the end of the line. Um, I mentioned calling the floor already. Um, don't give lessons is, is a big one. I wish more people had that. So you'll be playing very often and somebody makes some move and they do something and other people at the table start explaining to them why they played it badly and what they really should have been doing. First of all, you don't want to improve the play of your opponents, but also uh, this could really bother some people. Um, they say also, don't tap the glass. Does anyone understand that expression? So in an aquarium, you have fish. And if you tap the glass, you get their attention, and they might become less fishy, right? And so the idea is here that if you find someone at your table that's playing really, really badly, um, if you correct them, other players won't like it. You know, so keep that in mind. Um, and don't belittle bad play. You often see someone say, how stupid are you to make that call? You know, you want to encourage it, not belittle it. <laughs> OK, um, this is, I think, my last bit of etiquette, which is um, arrange your chips in stacks of 20s. Some people, I have a friend who has a pet peeve, where if your chips are up in stacks of 10, they, they get annoyed. I don't have that pet peeve. I don't know why people do that. But in a tournament, it's actually considered bad form not to have your, your chips in stacks of 20. So let me ask you a question. I want to get a show of hands. This is going to be a race. I want to see whose hands goes up first. And I will tell you that I could probably do this in about two seconds. And so will you be able to once I tell you how to do it. How much money is here? Yes, in front. Uh, 300. 300. Um, do we have a? Do we have a, another in the back? Oh, far sweater. 1120 was the answer. Correct. And the way that you can do this super fast is you see the front stack is $25, so you know that it's a stack of 20, right? So every player who plays a lot knows that 20 25 dollars is $500. Right? So if you see a stack of 25s, in cash game, 25s are very common. You're just like, that's $500. You don't even have to think about it. That's $500. Then you see the three $100 chips. And then you see the three red stacks. The so red chips are $5. And that's 100. So every one of those stacks is 100. And the white chips match it. So we've got 500 plus 600 is 1,120. So if you show this to an experienced poker player, they're like, oh, you got 1120. It's just, just like that. That's important because a lot of your decisions are made based on stack sizes. And stack sizes are effective stack sizes. And it's sportsmanship for your chips to make it really obvious what you have. Because you've got stacks of 20s. Every green stack's 500. Every red stack's 100. The black chips are 100. The white chips are 1. And so you can just look at this and know what it is. 
So let me talk a little bit about behavior. This is Patrick Antonius. He's very famous for having the best poker face in poker. In fact, I went to Google Images and typed poker face, and I got Lady Gaga, and I got Patrick Antonius. So that's where I got this picture. I think that it's sort of really nice to be able to act the same when you win a bad beat as when you lose a bad beat. Try to have the exact same expression. It's a far cry from some players who, um, I've been at a table where I lost a bad beat to a guy, and he goes, yes, 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 like that, you know, and I'm like, come on, dude, I just lost $1,000. That's not very nice, right? You know, but how about the guy where if you were to look at him, you can't tell if he just won $1,000 or lost $1,000. I think that's pretty cool, and I think I try to emulate that to where if I win a big hand, I just collect my chips, and if I lose it, I just put my chips in and try to have the same demeanor. Um, lastly, <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you my opinion about shades and hoodies. You see guys like this all the time in the casinos, and it's kind of fun. And I will tell you that some people disagree with me. Uh, you can find pictures of Phil Helmuth wearing uh, shades. Um, but I think it act if you can look into my eyes, and you can tell whether I'm bluffing or not, okay, you're too good for me. I shouldn't be playing with you. I don't think the pupils of my eyes are giving away any information. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't like it. If you play in the seniors, nobody wears shades. Well, they don't see very well, but in general, it's, you know, it's really a young gun kind of thing where they're trying to intimidate with the hoodie and the shades. I think some people, they couldn't play without them. They've gotten so used to having it. And I actually think it can be a disadvantage because you might pick up on tells and reads of things that are going on around you. Um, in fact, I have a, an anecdote that I've seen people that will put their sunglasses up on their head and when they're really strong, they'll bring them down. They look at their hand and they, they do this. And it's like, come on, that's such an easy tell. Okay, so, um, so please don't wear shades at the table. Um, so I have to show you guys something uh, before I get in. Uh, last bit towards Steve Daneman is uh, if you'll remember, I sent out an email to the class and I said, uh, during Steve Daneman's uh, talk, let's not play poker. And I just want to say, we were videotaping the class and you see in the bottom right, there actually was somebody playing poker. So this is the new age of surveillance. I decided to anonymize the person to protect their identity. <laughs> but um, nowadays, I'm a computer security expert and so uh, you can't really hide. This is Steve Daneman's last hand. He mentioned it yesterday. I thought it would be good to look at it. So I, I really like what a good sport Steve Daneman is, though. I've seen a lot of heads up play in the final table, and the guy that wins just runs off with his friends and forgets about the guy that loses. We gave him a hug, and uh, I, I just thought he was terrific. Um, so now I'm going to switch gears. We need to cover the turn and the river still in this course, and we've got one and a half lectures left. Question. Okay, good question. So the etiquette about getting up and leaving the table for a while. So in a cash game, you can leave any time. If you miss the blinds while you're away, uh, they're going to put a little button in front of your seat saying missed blind. And then when you come back, you're going to have to post the blinds no matter what seat you're in. So you'll just put your blind in. You may have noticed, in fact, poker stars always post your blind when you sit down. Most casinos won't the first time you sit down, but if you get up and come back, now, every time there's a new dealer, every half hour, the dealers rotate. And if there's a new dealer and you're not there for the big blind, they're going to put another button there. That way they keep track. You can only be away for an hour. So if they have two of those buttons there and a new dealer comes in, they're going to take your chips off the table. Now, they will bag them and they'll, they'll store them and you can come back and claim them and they have everything on camera. But if you want to leave for more than an hour, you should take your chips and cash out and then get back in the line for the waiting list. In a tournament, you can come and go however you please, but you're going to miss hands and you're going to miss your blinds. In fact, if you're not at the table in a tournament, they'll still deal your hand because all the players want their cards in the right order. But in a cash game, if you're not at the table, they won't deal you in. They'll deal the other people in. Any other questions? Okay. So let's look at the considerations on the turn. At this point, four of the five community cards have been dealt, and there's only one card left to come. And you need to consider how many players remain in the hand and the type of player they are. Very often, they're just going to be two players at this point. 
You need to consider your position. Starting to look familiar, this is very similar to what you want to care about on the flop. Who has the betting lead? The betting lead might change in a hand. So somebody pre-flop might have raised and somebody might have called and then on the flop the betting lead changes because somebody uh, raises someone else and becomes the, the, the lead. Remember on the flop we had all these categories like you're the aggressor pre-flop, you're in position, you're, the, you're not the aggressor, you're out of position, etc. Well on the turn that matters as well. Now on the, on the turn we care a lot more about the pot size relative to the effect of stacks because in most cash games by the time you get to a turn in a big hand you're going to start getting into pot commitment. You're, you're going to be starting to get to the point where the amount of chips you have left is getting close to the size of the pot and there might even be less than the size of the pot. Um, is the board wet or dry? I noticed in the tournaments online sometimes uh, some of you would comment wet, wet, wet when a flop would come. <laughs> so I was glad to see you guys were learning. Just uh, don't tell your opponents that. They may have forgotten to think about that. Um, and then you should remember that you had your ranges pre-flop and post-flop and now you've got to redo ranging on the turn. And as I mentioned earlier, the last thing that you want to do is put a hand back in someone's range because of the turn card. So if you had them on a particular range based on their pre-flop play and then the flop play narrows that range and you can only really narrow range, you can never increase the range, right? Because those were all the hands that you could have. And then the flop means that you could rule out this set of hands and that set of hands, so now you've got a range. And on the turn you can further narrow the range. But what a lot of people do is they fear the boogeyman. They're like, well that turn was a queen and I'm, now I'm really worried they have a queen. If a queen wasn't in that range before, don't put it back in the range. Uh, here's another interesting thing. If you're ahead on the turn, you're likely to stay ahead. And you're half as likely to improve a hand on the turn as you are on the flop. And why is that? Let's look at the likelihood of improving. So let's say you have a low pair versus a high pair. We know that that's 80-20 pre-flop, right? But after the flop, the low pair is only 10% to win that, right? There's only two more cards. And after the turn, only 5% to improve. Um, it's even more dramatic if you look at, let's say, uh, the flush draw versus a high pair. So after the flop, you know, we're almost 40% with our flush draw to win if we were to deal it out. But after the turn, we're only 20%. And this is something that you really have to take into account when you're playing the hand, that the draws on the flop can look very attractive. Draws on the turn don't look so attractive because you're half as likely to complete them as you were on the flop. So it's really hard to get the odds to draw on the turn. And most of the time, you'll end up throwing away your draws, which is a reason why in tournaments, if you have a stack that's not too big and you're on the flop with a big draw, it's usually better to get it all in than it is to just call a bet. Anybody not see why? You're going to see two cards and have twice the odds of hitting. The last thing you want is you call the bet, you miss, you call another bet, you miss, and then river, and you've lost a lot of chips. Now. I think it's really interesting to look at how certain draws are more likely to get paid off than others. So we're talking about the turn and let's compare two hands. So this is hand A. We have ace jack and the board is seven six five deuce. So we have a really big draw, right? What's our draw? Anybody see what our draw is? Yes. Flush draw. The nut flush draw, right? Any diamond and nobody can have a better hand than us if, unless it's the six of diamonds, right? If it's the six of diamonds, then full houses are in play. But any other diamond, and we have the best possible hand. Now let's look at hand B. We have seven, eight of diamonds on this board. We also have a really big draw, almost as many outs. What's our draw? Straight draw, right? Because we have six, seven, eight, nine. So a five or a ten gives us a straight. Now if you're had, let's say that you have hand A and you hit your flush draw, are you going to get paid? In order for your draw to come in, the fourth diamond has to come, right? So let's say that the three of diamonds comes on the river. Are you going to get paid by someone that has pocket jacks? No, right? Unless they have the jack of diamonds, obviously. But um, in general, your implied odds are pretty low on that draw. But let's look at the second situation. And let's say in hand B, you hit your straight. Are you going to get paid? Well, it depends. So if it's the ten of spades, you may not get paid the same as if it's the ten of clubs. 
And this is important because up till now, all I've ever taught you is calculate your outs, and then you know whether to call or fold. But here we have to look at implied odds based on how scary or what the texture of the board is, right? Because having a flush draw to four diamonds on the board is really not that exciting a draw. You're either not going to hit it, in which case you just have ace high, or you're going to hit it, in which case you won't get paid. Whereas the second one, you could say, well, you have six amazing outs, right? Let's say that you're in this hand and you're up against the guy with ace king and the five of clubs comes on the river. Is there anything he's going to be worried about? Probably not, but you just made a straight, right? If it's the five of spades, he might be worried about the flush. So the lesson is that if you want to draw and you have a tough decision. Let's say you do your pot odds calculation and your odds against and you get a wash, meaning they're the same and so you could go either way. Be more inclined to do it if the draw's going to be disguised than if the draw's not going to be disguised if you hit it. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Now, the other thing is, and this is super important, and I have to say this is something if you play for two hours, you're going to apply this a couple of times. The order that the flush draws arrive is important. So let's say your flop is ace, nine, six, and the turn is the two of spades. Now, if a ten of spades comes on the river, you're going to be given less credit for a flush if you have your card. So on the turn, if you're drawing, keep in mind whether that last flush card came on the turn or on the flop. For example, if the flop came like this, and the turn is a six, and then the ten of spades comes, they're going to think you're more likely to hit your draw. And the reason is that you must have called something on the flop. And if you called something on the flop in the second scenario, one of the things that's very likely is that you had a flush draw. But in the first scenario, there was no flush draw on the flop, and it's called a backdoor. So maybe you were just floating, right? Remember the float? So let's say the guy with ace-king bets, and you don't have anything, but you decide it's time to float. So you float on the flop, and you luckily get the two of spades on the turn. Now you picked up a lot of equity because all of a sudden you have a flush draw. But not only do you have a flush draw, you have a really well disguised flush draw because he's never going to put you on a flush draw because the range that he had for you on the flop did not include flush draws. So that's a really good situation to be in. Okay, so what are the reasons to bet the turn? Well, you have a hand and you check the flop. And so you check the flop maybe for deception and now it's time to get some value. You don't have a hand and you check the flop, so if the opponent is checking, then maybe you try to take a stab and win it here. We talked about the continuation bet on the flop, and I said you should continuation bet on the order of 100% of the time in position, right? And, and I still think that continuation bet is something you should do a lot. But let's say that you get called, and you don't know if your opponent is floating or if they have a medium hand, and you didn't get raised, so maybe they don't have a super strong hand, what's called a double barrel continuation bet, or some people will just call it double barreling, is to bet again with nothing on the, on the turn. And so double barreling is a reason to bet on the turn. Another reason is if you want to charge the draws, and you need to bet at least half the pot to charge most, most draws. Another reason to bet the turn is before the cooler comes. A cooler is a card that's going to cool the action. It's going to scare your opponent. And if you have an actual hand, um, and let's say you have two pair, and you don't think your opponent has a flush, but that flush comes on the river, the problem is they may not call another bet, even though they had top pair, top kicker, and they would have. The other thing is, let's say you've got a monster hand, and you want to you build a pot. Or you want to put in a massive bluff, which I don't recommend too often, but sometimes you have to do it. Um, and so you put a bet in on the turn to build a pot so that the bet on the river that it's all in doesn't look like too big an overbet. So let me now look at some, we've just talked a bunch of theory now, so let's apply it. And we're going to look at a hand example. And this is a realistic hand out of Harrington. So you have five deuce. Before I show you this hand, um, what is the only circumstance that you're playing this hand? Let me see somebody with a hand, yes. A squeeze, that is definitely, okay. What is another circumstance where you might play the hand? Yes? Everybody's limped, right? Right, so everybody limps and you're in the big blind. But you're right, you can squeeze with it. 
OK, so the setup is we're in a 10-20 game. This is a big game. And you're in the big blind, and you're a lag. So, so remember the setup. So that's going to come into play later. What is lag? Loose aggressive, right? You play a lot of hands. And the other players are a mix of loose and tight, and you have $6,200, so you have 300 big blinds, super big. And the player C in third position is a fine player, mostly tagged with a $3,400 stack. The small blind seems a little wacky. That's just an observation you've made. And I've put everything up top on the right here. Your lag was 6,200, player C tag with 3,400, small blind wacky, your hand is five deuce. Now, the first two players fold, C limps for 20, everyone folds to the small blind who calls, and the pot is 60, and you check. I'm not even going to ask you what would you do here. You're obviously not going to raise. And the flop comes 6, 4, 3 with two spades. OK, do your little dance, do your little dance. You just flopped a straight, and your straight is the second best possible hand right now, right? 5-7 is beating you. We're just not going to worry about it. So whenever we're in a hand and there's one other hand that can beat us, we just rule it out. You know what? I'm willing to go broke if the other guy has 5-7. It's not going to happen that often. And now the small blind bets $60. OK, so what are you going to go do? Call a raise. They call. Who likes call? Who likes raise? Who wants to fold? Okay. All right. So it's pot of 60 and it's $60 to call. I'm going to tell you the answer in a minute, at least Harrington's answer. The small blind is representing strength. Player C called preflop in early position and he's a tag, so he's not going to do that with nothing. So a raise might get called. Also, you're a lag, and this is why your image is so important. If you're not a lag, the answer might be different, but they're gonna, they know that you're loose and aggressive. And there's a flush draw on the board, which you want to protect against, and you've got two opponents, one of whom could be drawing to the flush. So based on all these considerations, you should put in a raise to $200. Okay, what are the considerations? The flush draw, right? You're going to get beaten, so you've got to charge them. The fact that you're a lag and you have that reputation, and the fact that these players have shown some interest in the pot. Remember when you have a monster, the goal is to get money into the pot, and if you're not sure between a passive play or aggressive play, take the aggressive play when you have a monster like that. So now there's 320 in the pot. Player C calls the, the, uh, the $200 and the small blind folds. So now the pot is 520. OK, so you got called, so that's awesome. And now we know that the small blind must have just been betting 60 with nothing because he folded to your raise. And C must be strong, right? He's a tag, and he called your $200 raise, although he knows you're a lag. He did limp in early position, which not a play I condone, but um, it, he probably had something. Let's walk through what we think he could possibly have. And this is an exercise I always want you to do when you're in a hand. He could have an overpair, but remember, every, every time you're considering, so jacks, queens, something over the board, he didn't raise preflop, right? So that makes the overpair a little less likely. He just limped. A set. I don't think that he could have a set if he's a good player because um, the flush is out there, the possible straights, and he would have raised for the same reason that you raised. Two pair is possible, but would he really limp with 6, 4, 4, 3, 3, 6? Those are the only hands that could make two pair. So I'm not thinking that's really likely in early position from a tag. Top pair, um, top pair means he either has like a 6, 6, 7, 8, 6. It's really kind of hard to find a combination of hands that would limp in early position by a tag that he has here. What about a flush draw, like ace, jack of spades, king, queen of spades? I think that. Every way that he's played this hand uh, is consistent with that. So I'm going to put that very high on his list. A straight draw, well, it's possible. What did he have? Like ace-5 suited, 5-6, five, 5-4. Five, Most of these hands are not limping in early position by a tag. Could he have 5-7? Well, if he has it, he has it. The most likely straight and flush draws, possibly with a pair. Okay, So you see the exercise I just went through? Um, I recommend when you're playing live that you do that. I also recommend if you're in a hand and you remember everything that happened in the hand and you go home later and you want to study poker, you recreate the hand and then walk through this analysis of what they had. 
So now we have the range. Now the turn card is the queen of clubs. Woohoo! We love that turn card, right? What do we do? Okay, well our consideration is we have the best hand right now unless he has 5-7, the flush did not come in. We even hope he has a pair of queens, right? We hope he has ace-queen of spades, all kinds of hands that we hope he has. That queen is great for us. Most likely he's still drawing to that flush, and so the turn is safe. Now if a spade comes on the river, our plan is to check, and then he's often going to bet. Um, if we get bluffed, um, you know, that's going to be a problem. We don't want to get bluffed. And so that's a reason why we're going to bet now. If a spade doesn't come on the river, uh, we're going to bet, but he's probably not going to call. So we bet 600 slightly over the pot. Why am I putting in such a big bet here? Remember, this section is to educate uh, you guys on turn play. Because this is a crucial moment in the hand. There, you think he's probably on a flush draw, and there's a flush draw out there. You really want to force him to make a mistake. And the last thing you want to do is lose this hand because a spade comes on the river and he bluffs you. Or worse, a spade comes on the river and he makes this flush. So now we're ahead. Let's push the action right now. So we make it $600. Now he calls. Uh-oh. And the pot is $1720. OK. Oh, man. So the river card is a seven of spades. That is the worst possible card in the deck for us, right? It just completes the flush, which is what we think that he has. It's a straight is a chop if he has a five. So it's called a classic cooler card. And then you check because you're just very unhappy, and he checks. Apparently, you're both scared that he has the flush, and he turns over 4-6 for two pair. So now I'm going to post these slides online on hopkinspokercourse.com. And I want you, as an exercise, to go back later and work through this hand from his point of view. Look at every decision that you made and ask yourself, you know, is he able to put you on a made straight? And is he putting you on the flush draw? Because his decisions are going to be based on what he thinks that you did. So that cooler cost you money on the river, right? If a card like the, you know, two of hearts or, or you know, ace or something, any other card had come that didn't complete the spades, he's going to like his two pair and you'll probably get called another bet. All right, so some lessons from this hand. If you're strong on the flop and the turn is safe, bet the turn. And be careful of that cooler. Let me talk about the, the concept of leverage. This is something Howard Letterer introduced, and it's the most important turn concept that there is. Um, and the idea is, if you're facing a bet on the turn, you don't know how much of a bet you're going to be facing on the river. You don't really know what pot odds you're getting, because you know what pot odds you're getting for that turn bet, but what happens if you call the turn and then he bets a lot more on the river? So you're sort of in no man's land. You might be willing to call x, but not x plus y, and he could very well bet y on the river. So facing a bet of x on the river after a check turn, you will know what it is. And so this has to do with leverage and deleverage. If you want the person to call, you might, and you, you think they'll call one bet, you might want to check the turn and bet the river. Because if you, check, if you bet the turn and they're willing to call one bet, they'll fold because they don't know how much you're going to bet on the river. And the reverse is if you're bluffing, on the turn, you put in a big bet, they know that they're not only necessarily calling, let's say they've got a medium pair, OK? Um, and you put in a big bet on the turn that they're willing to call, but then they're like, well, what if he shoves the river? And then they fold. So leverage is very powerful. So um, I found a hand that demonstrates the leverage concept. OK, so you're in a 5-10 game, and the players are tight, smart, and aggressive, like they are, usually are in a 5-10 game. And you've got 660 in your stack. You're going to be fourth to act. Three players fold, and you're in middle position with king, queen of spades. It's pretty standard here for you to raise to 30, three big blinds. And the player in sixth position is going to call. And the blind will call 20 because they've already put some in the, uh, in the big blinds already got $10 in there, so he adds 20. So now we've got a pot of $95 and we're going to be in middle position after the flop. Now let's say the flop comes king 9-4. We're pretty happy with that one. We're not doing our dance, but we're happy. And the big blind checks and you're going to bet 80. Okay, that's perfectly reasonable play. You've got top pair with a good kicker. 
and you're in position against the big blind. The other player folds and the big blind calls you. And now there's 255 in and you have 550 left. Always look at how much you have left. The big blind has you covered, so now your effective stack is 550. And the turn card is the ace of clubs. And the big blind bets 150. So the question is, what are you going to do? And this is a really tough spot because you were good on the flop. And when you bet the flop and he called you, you bet almost pot and he called you. So I wouldn't put a lot of aces in his range, right? Because if he called you on that king nine four flop with what ace? Like, did he have ace nine? Possibly had ace nine, but most of his hands don't contain an ace in them. But now he bets 150. And I would say, if we're on the river and we're in the spot, we're going to call. Let's, let's keep him honest and let's, let's just not give up. But the problem is, if he has an ace, you're in bad shape. And if he does not have an ace, you're probably way ahead. And the big blind knows if he's bluffing or not, but you don't know if he's bluffing or not. So he knows that if you call his bluff, he doesn't have to bet on the river. But you don't know that. You think he might bet again on the river. So you might be willing to call $150, um, but you don't know what he's going to do, and you don't know if he has that ace. And this is a situation where he's got leverage on you, because you have to fear two bets, but he only has to risk one bet. Because if you call him, he's going to check the river, but you don't know that he's going to do that. And you can't risk him shoving on the river. So now you're going to probably have to fold. Let's look at reasons why you might check the turn. After you continuation bet the flop and you get called, maybe it's time to give up. You could check on the turn as a trap. You've got a really strong hand and you think that if you check that they're going to bet. And also as a deleveraging play, right? You don't want to leverage your opponent and if you bet, they're going to fear two, two bets. And so if you have a hand that wants to get called, it's very common, unless there are big draws out there, to check the turn and then bet the river. And then finally is a bluff catcher. A bluff catcher is a hand that's not good enough to bet for value, but it is good enough to call if you think your opponent is, is betting. OK, another hand. Let's study this board for a second. You're one behind the button with $14,000, and the blinds are $25.50. Somehow you found yourself in a really expensive cash game. And notice that the two stacks to your left are decent. The one to your right is decent. The rest of the stacks are a lot shorter. And player E is a loose pre-flop aggressive post-flop. And you'll often see that. People that, they'll just play almost anything pre-flop, but once they're in a hand, they really push the action. Your image is that you're a good player who likes to trap, because that's how you've been playing. And you get dealt pocket sevens. OK, everybody before E folds, and player E, who is a lag preflop, raises to $200. Do you fold, call, or raise? So fold. Uh, you guys all know that this is a turn lesson, so if you fold now, we wouldn't get to the turn. Uh, call, raise. OK, let's have some considerations here. So four big blinds is a large raise. He put in four big blinds, not three. You're going to have position throughout the hand. That, that is an indicator for a call. A medium pair is too strong to fold. The stacks are super deep. So really, the implied odds are great if you hit a monster. So what you want to do here is set mine, meaning you want to call to hope to see a set. So you call the $200, and the button and the blinds fold. Now, if I told you that your stacks were $1,000 each, that's different. I think if your stacks are $1,000 each, you shove or you fold. And those are both reasonable plays. If you think that he doesn't have a bigger pair than you, shove it in there. But with $1,000, you don't have enough implied odds to go for that set. right? You need, you're only going to hit a set um, one out of every eight and a half times that you have a pair. And so you need to have pretty good implied odds, deep stack that is, in order to call to mine for a set. So now he calls you in the pot, or you call, I'm sorry, in the pot is 475, and the flop comes 973. OK, well, that's pretty good. And then he bets $350, and the pot is 825. And so the question is whether you're going to call or raise. 
So I'll survey you guys. I'm going to give you a little second to think about it. Think about what the considerations are that I'm going to show you. OK, call, raise. OK. Um, it's a dry board, right? So we don't really need to deny draws. 9-7 has some possible straights, and so does 7-3, but not likely the hands that your opponent has. No flush draws. Does a dry board indicate a call or a, or a raise? Call? It does, right? Because you're not trying to charge. First, you're not really worried about any draws, and you're not trying to charge any draws. So you should be more inclined to call on a dry board. So the two scenarios are that he has something. So we're going to assume here that, that we're good. Okay, It's a lot easier to reason if we make that assumption. What's the only hand that beats us right now? Pocket nines. So we're going to be like, fine. Pocket nines, yes, pocket nines. That's poker. OK, so let's assume that he either has something or he has nothing. If he has something, what does he have? Queens, jacks, tens, or ace, nine. Did he play it like those hands? Yes, he did. He has nothing. He's got a pair below the nines, like fives or something, or absolute squadouche, like queen 10. That's a Norman Chad uh, expression. So we're going to ignore the possibility of 9-9. Nine, nine. And let's now break it down in terms of making our turn decision as to whether he has nothing or he has something. The two plays are call raise. So let's say he has nothing and we raise. That's the scenario we're going to look at. If he has nothing and we raise, he's going to fold and we'll win the pot and the hand ends here. If he has nothing and we call, we may win more money because he could hit one of his cards. Let's say he has king jack and we just call um, and then a jack comes on the turn. So then he might play another bet. He could also hit a lower set, which would be kind of cool. Let's say he has pocket fives and a five comes on the turn. 10% of the time, we're going to say that he improves on the turn and can call another bet. So if we call 350, we create a pot of 1175. Now, if we bet 700 on the turn, on the average, we're going to pick up $70. Why? Because we said 10% of the time he improves and he can call a bet. So if we bet 700 on the turn, on average, we're going to make $70 more. I can go through that more if anybody doesn't see that. OK. So let's say he has something and we raise, like he has jack-jack. If we raise to 1,100, calling is 350, we're adding another 750. Let's say that one-third of the time he'll call us. OK, that makes sense. Pocket jacks is two-thirds of the time they're going to fold, but a lot of players will also call there. And that makes a pot of 2675. And then a blank on the turn, and we, um, will he call 1,200? Well, maybe a third of the time, so we win an extra 750 on the flop, an extra 400 on the turn, which is one-third of the 1,200, so an extra 1,150. So let's say he has something and we call. Our pot is 1,175. Um, now, let's say the turn is blank. We bet, he ra we raise, he bets, we raise, we win the pot. He checks, we bet, and he calls. And either way, we're going to say we win about $700. So the bottom line is to break down the scenario. He has nothing and he has something. When he has nothing and we call, we win $70 more. If we raise, we win zero, right? Because he's going to fold. If he has something and we call, we're going to win $700. If he has something and we raise, we're going to win 1150 This is just what I went through on the previous slide, like that a third of the time he's going to call that raise, and this is how much we're going to raise. So the bottom line is that if we see these, these numbers, that even if he has nothing is more likely, the amount we win if he has something greatly favors raising to calling. And this should be kind of a rule of thumb for you. If you have a really strong hand and you don't know what your opponent has, you're better off raising than calling if he bets. And so many players are afraid of chasing someone away that they don't do that. But the problem with that is that you're keeping the pot small when you have a really, really strong hand. And even if only one quarter of the time they're going to call that raise of yours and the other three quarters you're going to be really disappointed, you're going to make so much money in the instances where they do call that it will overshadow the money you don't make you know, by not raising. So you, sh you should raise. So in this hand, you raise to 1,100. He calls the extra 750, and the pot is now 2675 and his stack is 10,900. 
and you have him covered. Now the turn is the king of diamonds. He checks, what do you do? Bet? Check? Okay, well let's look at what his range is. He called the raise on the flop, but he checked the turn. So possibilities are, he could have an overpair, ace nine, king nine, queen nine. Nimes is looking a little more likely now, the way he's playing the hand, but we're still just not gonna worry about it. He could also have 10-8 and 8-6, because that'll give him straight draws, and he could have called you with an open-ended draw. Now you're ahead of all of these except for kings and nines. And your goal, don't forget your goal, is to get his whole stack. Half the pot will give the draws the wrong price to call. Obviously if he's drawing to a straight and he hits the straight, you're gonna lose. So you bet 1400 into a pot of 2675, and now he raises you to 5500. So the pot is 9575 and it's 4100 to call. And he has 5400 left, now what do you do? So let me go back to that so you can see. He, you put in 1400 into 2675 and he raises to 5500. Who folds? Who calls? Who shoves all in? Okay. Don't fold. <laughs> I will tell you this. If you don't learn anything else in this course, I want you to learn the following. Don't fold sets on dry boards. Just don't do it. If you have a set on a board that doesn't have a lot of straights and flushes on it, you're almost always good. And if you're not good, it's a bad beat, and that's fine. If you call, the pot will be 1365. And the question is, would you call a river shove, which would put the pot at 19,000? And it would be $5,400 for you to call if he shoves. And the pot odds would be four to one, and you have a set. So if you can't fold the river, and the pot is larger than the stocks, then you should shove the turn. I know I probably went through this example kind of fast. And what I think is now that I've walked you through it, if you're one of the students in the class who's really interested in learning poker and getting good at it, this would be a good hand for you to go and look at on your own later. The slides, I'll post them later today on the website where I've been posting things, hopkinspokercourse.com. And go through and evaluate the slide a little more carefully. Look at all the numbers. Make sure that you agree with everything I said. Um, and this hand, again, comes from Harrington. So now what's interesting is you push all in and he folds. So he was bluffing all along, and I would say that you won the maximum in the hand. And the lessons from this hand are always evaluate ranges. That's your tool. You're going to have a range of hands. And remember, when we looked at the turn, we started with his range again. And we didn't start off by saying, I think he has kings or ace-king. We stuck to the range that we had set for him. And then you base your decisions on the pot sizes, the stack sizes, and the most profitable scenario. Remember, we went through and we said, well, what if we, we bet? What if, you know, he has something and we bet? Or what if he has something and we call? And then what if he doesn't have something and we bet and he doesn't have something we call? You'll almost always find that you're better off raising because when he does have something, you're going to get paid. Um, if there are no straight and flush draws, um, don't fold a set. I mean, if the board's not paired. And if the board is paired and you have a set, what do you have? You have full house or quads, so, so you're probably not folding there either. And think about how to win the, mox, the maximum. So when you have a monster, think about that. All right, I have a few more turn hands. I'm going to decide whether to show you them tomorrow or not. The one hand I really want to show you that I think everyone will find interesting is a hand with a really interesting turn decision that I played in a 2-5 game at Maryland Live. So I went home after the hand and I wrote everything down that happened and it took me about three hours, I'm not exaggerating, to make the PowerPoint for that hand because there was a lot of math, there was a lot of ranging, things that I didn't actually do when I was in the hand. Hand has a surprising ending, um, it's not a bad beat story and um, when I walk you through it I think we'll cover a lot of the fundamentals that we've learned in the entire course came into play in that hand. So even though I'm going to try to do a lot of river stuff in lecture tomorrow, I want to show you that hand that I played at Maryland Live.